Joining us now is the former Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Paul Ryan. Good to see you, sir. Thanks Good for being you, here. Appreciate nice it. Nice to be here. Uh, I want to get to Kevin McCarthy in a moment, but first, with all this news about classified documents, whether President Biden or President Trump, I want to just ask you as somebody who, when you were Speaker of the House, had access yeah, yeah. to classified documents, if you could like give us some sort of insight into how easy or not or difficult it might be to actually accidentally or... No, I never took them home. I left them in my safe in the office. Is that right? Uh, and they went from my safe in the office down to the skiff and then back to the safe in the office. So I never... I never took them on my body. They were in locked briefcases, so I never even took them out of the office. But I guess it would be different if you're president, maybe? I'm trying to figure it out, whether you're Trump I guess or it's Biden. The, it's, it's the system you put in place in your office, I guess. And you had a rigid system. I had a rigid system, which they went from the intelligence community to a safe in my office that one cleared staffer of mine had access to. We would take them from the safe down to the skiff, which is you know underground in the Capitol, I would read them there, discuss them there, have my briefings there. We'd go back to the office and they'd go in that safe, in, either in the skiff safe or in the safe in my office, and they would no, go nowhere else. Sounds like a pretty good process. So that's the way we did things, yeah. <laughs> okay, so. let's talk about uh, the House race uh, because this hasn't happened. We saw something last week that hasn't happened in 100 years and, and longer if you want to go to, to the number of yeah. ballots. Uh, a, a serious battle on the floor of the House to be Speaker of the House. And some very serious personal criticisms of the man who ultimately uh, won election, uh, Kevin McCarthy, uh, including about whether or not he's trustworthy and the like. As a friend of his, as somebody who was speaker when he was House uh, Majority Leader, um, what was going through your mind when you watched it all play out? I thought he was going to gut it out. I didn't think it'd take 15 votes. So I suppose between like vote four and 14, I wasn't so sure, but I still thought he, there was no alternative. So because there was really no alternative, that, that's kind of, the dynamic was different when I was there because I was seen as the alternative. And I was not looking for the job. I sort of got drafted into it. Um, but that, there was no dynamic like that at, at play here. And Kevin had done so much more. First of all, remember, I came midterm. So Boehner, it was a motion to vacate, was being placed upon Boehner. So I came midterm. Kevin had just worked his tail off to campaign and fundraise to build this majority over two cycles, and he did that. So it's a different dynamic than what occurred in 2015 with me, which was Kevin was the leader of the conference as a minority leader for two cycles, built that majority, and then there really wasn't another alternative for people to go to. So I really thought that he would get through it, um, even with this tough margin. I just didn't think it'd take 15 votes and all those concessions that it took, but it did. Uh, there's this moment, well, let's just show it right now, where obviously we're Armed Services Committee uh, Chairman yeah, I, Mike I, Rogers. You don't even have to show me the picture I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> there he is lunging at uh, Congressman Matt Gates uh, after Gates um, did not vote aye, uh, thus uh, stopping McCarthy from winning on the 14th ballot. Does this bode ill for your party's ability to unite and actually govern? Look, no, I mean, Mike, these guys are, that's Richard Hudson behind him, very good friends of mine. Um, Richard's a good friend of Mike's. Mike just got hot under the collar. He just got, you know, for, they were pretty exasperated by that time. And my understanding is Matt Gates was going to vote for him on the 14th vote and then change his mind in the vote without telling anybody. That makes people pretty upset. So, look, hot heads happen. Things like that occur. By the way, that's what the floor is like when you ever have any contentious vote. I just know C-SPAN usually doesn't cover that because of the cameras, but that, it's always like that on the so floor. So should we have the... When you have difficult votes. Gates wants the cameras, and I have to say I support No, I, I'm not a, I'm not a, fan, not a of fan of the performance that? art that has overtaken our politics and the entertainment wings of both of our parties. Yeah. This would just feed into that. So no, I'm actually not a fan of that. But that is what the floor is like when you have tough, contentious votes. I've seen that movie a million times over. You just haven't seen it on C-SPAN. And no, I don't want to see the cameras do that because people are going to play to the cameras on the floor of Congress like they play to the cameras everywhere else they do in politics these days. Well, the counter argument would be you also see the humanity yeah, of I Democrats that, and Republicans I, sitting I, I together. Think we have a little too much entertainment in politics these days, so I'd frankly like to see that toned down. I don't want to add more gas to that fire. Such a buzzkill. Um, <laughs> McCarthy made so many concessions to this wing, the Chip Roy, Matt Gates, whoever, whatever, however you want to call it, these insurgents, these rebels. Um, to, and he made these concessions to get their votes. And without question, the concessions weakened the speakership and empowered individual members. The motion to vacate you mentioned, yeah. which yeah. got rid of John Boehner, is now back to one vote, uh, as it was before. But there are other, other things in terms of who's on the Rules Committee 
uh, opening up the process. Uh, anybody can offer a bill. Anybody can offer amendment. I like some of those, by the way. So some of those are pretty good. Well, the 72 hour one is a great one. The sure. idea that you need 72 yeah. hours to read a bill before you can vote. No, on but the it. appropriations ones, I like that. So, frankly, I, I think well, I didn't want to cut you off at your question, but let me say this. I think I had too much power as speaker. Oh, really? I really do. Yeah, absolutely. Look, the thing that bothered me the most were these omnibuses. Um, you know, a bill about that thick yeah. that four people ultimately decide on. 15 spending bills crunched together. 12 sp crunched together. And. And it's, it's, it's thousands of pages. It would be myself, Nancy, Chuck, and Mitch. I'm sorry, the, the House Speaker, oh, we know the Minority Leader. You know yeah, what yeah. I'm talking about. They were your friends. Basically, well, yeah. some of them are. Ish. Yeah. Ish, ish. I, we all got along. We all yeah. respected one another. The problem is no four people should be doing all of that, making those decisions. And, you know, frankly, I was making decisions on composition of spending bills. Um, you know, I think I'm a smart, principled person, but the guy... And the, and the man and the woman who's in the committee, in the subcommittee, spending two years reading Inspector General reports, GAO reports on those, they should be making those decisions, not kicked up to elected leadership. Are there any new rules or rule changes that concern you in terms of the free-for-all, in terms of whether or not what we saw last week is going to be kind of like the new normal? I think the vacate has become weaponized now. It's become normalized as an activity. I never was worried about this myself, frankly, uh, but that was just kind of my own dynamic, I suppose. But I think members now see this as sort of a tool they can take for a ride. Um, I think that's bad for the institution. The last thing John Boehner, literally the last words John Boehner said to me as he walked out the door of his smoke-filled office that, <laughs> that I took over was, don't forget your number one job is to preserve this institution, defend the institution. And if you're a committee chair, which is what I was, I was chair of Ways and Means at the time, I never really thought about that. Most members don't think about the institution. Right. You're thinking about your policy agenda or whatever it is you want to get done in Congress. That's not normally what you're thinking of. So I became a big institutionalist, but it took me a little while once I became speaker because I realized just how important for our freedom and our liberty and our democracy this is. Let's talk about your book, American Renewal, a conservative plan to strengthen the social contract and save the country's finances. We are... Uh, currently, economists say whether we're in a recession or not, they're definitely headed into something called a slow session. Yeah. Uh, this morning, new inflation numbers showed the surge in prices fading slightly. Inflation still yeah. a, a threat. Um, what, if you were advising Kevin McCarthy and the House Republicans right now, what would you tell them to do about the U.S. economy? Yeah, they, they know what I think. I'm still friends with these guys. Uh, I think... Look, what I, what I say in this book is, first of all, the best case for America is a really long lost generation, a stagflation that is going to last more than just like a Japanese lost decade if we don't get our act together. Th that's the best case scenario. We're likely to have more of a debt crisis, which CBO talks about and projects, which is really ugly. That means the social contract is unaffordable. That means if you think we're polarized today, wait till we have a debt crisis. So what we're putting in this book are all the solutions we think are necessary to make sure that we can make good on our social contract, which I would argue center left and center right, we agree on. We want health and retirement security. We want a safety net. We believe in Medicare and Social Security and Medicaid. So let's make these things solvent. Let's make them work better. Let's make them guaranteed for the current retirees and make them solvent for the next generation so that they're there when we retire. That takes persuasion politics. So... I know that when you were speaker and Donald Trump was president, you guys would talk about this. <laughs> and he did not understand why you would ever want to do it because it's bad politics. That's right. That's right. He just didn't think it was ever popular. And he has, and I'm not blaming this all on him, but he has certainly empowered the kind of yeah. populism you're talking about, smash mouth, clicks, cable hits on Fox, et cetera, where you're a board member, by the way. Um, he has popularized that. He has empowered that. We saw it last week. So how can this be achieved even within the Republican yeah. Party before you even get to the Democrats? A couple things. He's fading fast. He's a proven loser. He cost us the House in 18. He cost us the White House in 20. He cost us the Senate again and again. And I think we all know that. And I think we're moving past Trump. I really think that's the case. I, do, I can't imagine him getting the nomination, frankly. And I'm, I don't mean this because I, I don't want him to get the nomination. I just don't think he will as an analytical point. The, the thing that's I, that I take solace in with all the machinations you saw last week, most of that wasn't personal. Most of that was around fiscal responsibility. Most of that was about a concern about spending, inflation, and debt. That's great. I think you need to persuade the country as to the solutions and the problem. And I don't think brinksmanship solves those things. 
But what's behind that is a good thing, which is Republicans finally reacquiring their moorings on the party of fiscal responsibility and limited government. That, to me, is the good thing that I see in all of this weird stuff. That's the good thing. So the yeah. question is, can we it's put a very positive interpretation? Can we put form and substance. Yeah. Well, I'm a Republican. <laughs> I, I, I am not a member of an organized rep party. I am a Republican. Republican. That's yeah. very nice. Yes. Little Will Rogers Will for Rogers. you. So the point I'm trying to make is, those juices are flowing and that is churning. And I think we're we're hopefully coming back full circle to being maybe a populist party. That's great and fine. I want to be popular, but principled and and with policies that solve problems. With governance, yeah. And fiscal conservatism is is was a theme that you saw be, behind all of those tactics. Sure, that's when, a good thing. When Congressman Chip Roy was on uh, State of the Union on Sunday, he said, "We know this debt crisis is coming with the debt ceiling." I like vote. hearing that. Let's get re let's get working on it now, right. as opposed to July. Right. I, I don't think you'll fix it with a debt crisis, but no. I think you you need to go persuade the country and offer solutions. And having gavels and chairmanships, I had two of them. That's what you do. You build the case at Ways and Means and Financial Services and Budget Committee. You show the public what it, what's, what's going on and why our solutions are better and why, frankly, if you just whistle past the graveyard and ignore these problems, you're hurting Americans. You're hurting the social Well, your that. kids you're and my kids. You're hurting the are social the, contract. Yeah, yeah, not just our kids, but seniors. Sure. So that's, that's Well, I meant like when you and I are seniors. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what I was referring to. Last quick question. Congressman George Santos, he's lied about uh, apparently everything on his resume. Uh, at least uh, six House Republicans have said he should resign, including five New York Republicans. Do you agree? Sure, yeah, sure, I agree. My guess is they'll probably let the budget ethics committee run its course. It's, it's a fraudulent candidacy. This isn't a embellished candidacy to fraudulent candidacy. He hoaxed his voters. So of course he should step down. He doesn't strike me as an honorable person though. I don't know the guy. So my guess is it will probably go through the ethics course. I, I can't imagine the guy's gonna stay very long. All right, former House Speaker Paul Ryan, good to see you, sir. Thanks for being good here. Good to see you.